Okay then. Um, hi, my name is Arne. Um, I'm going to talk about learning and teaching modern C++ about the challenges we face and the resources we face. Um, when I talk about teaching, I do not explicitly talk about like trainers or professors or teachers because maybe if you're just a bit more advanced than someone else in our team and we tell them something, this as well as already teaching. So, and um, we usually want to have some resources, for example, some point in the internet we want to point them to and, and or some books we want to give them. So um, it's very broadly speaking, teaching and um, mostly about learning. Um, well, my part in all this is um, I'm at a company where we do um, a lot of contract work. We work with customers who don't know, maybe don't know C++ as well, so we train them in C++. Um, we also have, um, of course, colleagues at different levels, so I also give some internal trainings uh, in C++, um, but I also have been writing a blog for about four years um, with uh, several dozen posts, so I would say writing about C++ either as blog posts or books um, would count a bit as teaching as well, in my opinion. Um, but first things first, um, what does modern C++ mean? I mean, if people talk about modern C++, um, you ask 30 different people, you get uh, 35 different opinions what modern C++ is. Um, usually amongst the first answers you get, well, uh, modern C++ designed the book. Um, this book has been written in 2001, that's 18 years ago. I think um, if you count basically the first appearance of the term C++, was like 83 or so, so it's basically half the time we have C++ already. So um, C++ has moved on since then. I mean, we got C++ 11, 14, 17. So um, there are a few good ideas in here, and if you haven't read it, you should. Um, for example, it introduced pretty much policy-based class design. Um, it had um, like one implementation for compile time assertions, which since C++ 11 we have now in the in the language. Um, type lists um, in the absence of uh, variadic templates and so on and so on. So a good read, but I wouldn't say that this is modern C++. Um, let's have a look at the definition of modern in Merriam-Webster. Um, the first one is, um, well, characteristic of the present or the immediate past, so contemporary, you could also call it contemporary C++, um, involving recent techniques, recent methods. I would definitely say this is part of modern C++ as well, so not only contemporary, but also up to date to what we know today, what we should do in C++. Um, Relating having the characteristics of the present or most recent period of development of a language um, certainly also applies. Um, I mean, many people say modern C++ is C++14 or C++17. Um, I'll come to that later. Um, I think we can do a modern C++ style when we are using C++03. So we don't can't ha don't have an excuse. We can't don't have access to the most recent compiler, so I can't write modern C++. Sorry we can still try to do as modern as possible. Uh, the last one, modernism is more to art, um, has abandoned the representation of recognizable objects. I hope we don't do this in our code, okay? So the first three, but not the latter. Um, there, there's a pretty famous quote by Bjarne Strustrup. There's a smaller language in C++. Um, that's simpler, safer, um, that's struggling to get out. I would say um, pretty much of what we teach today or what we try to teach as modern C++ or what we advocate is um, basically this a smaller subset of the C++ that's available to us. Uh, I wish we had this book, C++ a good part. <laughs> um, I wish I could write it, um, but it's really difficult to see which features go in and which features don't. So I don't have much more than the cover yet. Maybe a forward. Um, when I started to program, um, 
I would learn about basically all the language features. I would use them all because, hey, it feels good to know everything about the language, right? And um, I would use them. And um, it's, of course, it's a bit of showing off. And it also feels good because every colleague comes to me because I know the features. And if only it's to understand the code I have written. So um, this is this. Um, but at some point in the career, you figure out that, well, using all the features is not good because I better features and, and the features that maybe you shouldn't use. So um, you, we should leave some of the features away. Um, most programming languages contain good and bad parts. It, I discovered that um, it could be a better programmer by using only the good parts and not the bad parts. I mean, you can't build something good out of bad parts, right? So um, I mean, the standard committee has a difficult uh, proposition because it has so much old code that still has to be compatible because if they just would deprecate all the old features or just erase all the old features, um, programs would basically uh, riot. So um, they have to leave it all in, but we don't have to use it anymore. So um, this is a problem, but we have to deal with it. Um, so we have to the power to define our own subset that we can use. So this is basically the good parts of C++, the modern C++. Um, this is a forward of JavaScript, the good parts. <laughs> I, yes, yes. I really like that you did the talk yesterday. I, I, it's really cool. Um, as I said before, many people say if you just ask them what's modern C++, you get like uh, this five-letter answer, C++17. Uh, sometimes plus boost. Um, I wouldn't say so because, um, I mean, you can use C++17 features in very old code. You can also just switch the C++, did C++17 flag on your compiler and if it compiles, that's not modern C++. And the other way around, if you have like C with classes and range based 4, that's not modern C++ or Java without garbage, garbage collector and, and some modern features. Um, so what I would say is basically modern C++. It's, it's three parts. Um, it's, of course, new language features if they are available, but also um, the new compilers and, and new tools, because um, especially um, if you have seen the talk by Jason Turner yesterday about um, optimizers, optimizers really uh, develop over time. And um, you can't use the really new techniques, the expressive code, if you want so, um, unless your optimizer supports it and your optimizer strips it down to what it actually is. If you need the performance and your optimizer doesn't do the job for you, then you have to fall back to like old and, and, and cumbersome code. But also old features and idioms. I mean, um, RAI is not C++11, it's not C++14, it's, it's pre-C++03 or 98. So um, we should use RAI and we should use what the language inherently gives us. So basically these three are the three pillars of modern C++. That's what I talk about when I talk about modern C++. Um, modern C++ is pretty much a moving target because, well, we get new features every three years, new language features, new library fe features. We get some TSs. I mean, who in the room has already played around with ranges or some other TS here? So. Um, but besides the stuff that gets standardized and that gets provided by the compilers, um, the understanding we have of the language continually evolves. Um, I don't know who it was exactly yesterday. Um, someone mentioned that sometimes we just see the stuff we had for years and we discover new features that we can, that we can use in the language. like. Um, Templates existed for years until someone discovered, hey, those things are Turing complete. We can do crazy stuff at compile time. Um, 
but this also shows um, like um, pretty much closely before, I think it was closely before C++11 was finished, Scott Myers um, wrote his book, Modern Effective C++, using the term universal references. Shortly after that, the, com uh, the community and the committee like said, well, yeah, universal references doesn't really quite cut it. Let's call it forwarding references because it's more about what it does. So it's like not certain points in time where we discover new things, but it's continually evolving. And so a continually moving target. It's not only one moving target. I mean, we work for um, really s small microcontrollers. We work for cloud computing. We write code for mobile devices, um, for big data centers, um, for games. Usually some, all these things have in common that we um, write code for some domain where we have constraints. We have not enough memory. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough energy or something else. So um, it's often if you switch from one of these domains to another, it feels like the C++ that is in use there is a completely different language. Because they have to use different features, they can't use some features. And it's, it's, um, so it's, it's not one moving target, it's a lot of different moving targets. And it's really hard to write basically one book to teach C++ to all these people. For example, sales pitch for RII. Usually, if you come up with RII, the standard examples you see is um, like smart pointers for memory, lock guards for mutexes, um, file streams for, to close files if you're done with them. And um, the usual argument is exception safety. Well, um, tell the people who work with small devices. We don't have memory. We don't have any threads, no mutexes, we don't have any file system, no storage attached, um, we don't, we just shut off the exceptions. But we still can use RAI, it's still useful, for example, if we do things like early return from our functions and clean up after. So it's hard to come up with general advice for all these different people. Um, for those of us who teach or who teach a little of C++, there's an ad additional challenge. Most of us haven't learned yes, uh, C++ only yesterday. I think many of us have started learning C++, well, have started learning C and then C++. Um, I'm, luckily, I didn't have to learn C first. I, I started with C++, but still, I started with C++ 98 or 3. Then there came C++11, C++14, 17, and now the, all the 20 stuff and so on. So we have like this layered evolution in our heads and we usually think about this in this layered, layered evolution. And it gets pretty hard to not to go ahead and say, well, yeah, um, iterating over a container, well, there's the iterators and we start with begin and end, but now you don't have to use it anymore because there's range base four. Well, if you want to iterate over one container, over the full container, just tell them use range base four. That's the first they probably need to learn. And then later, and if you have to iterate over part of a container, well, then you have to use iterators or later ranges. Um, very important talk on this topic um, by Kate in 2015, stop teaching C. You don't need to start with C. So also don't start with owning raw pointers, start with smart, point, smart pointers right ahead if you do memory management. Um, okay, so much for the challenges with oh, the modern C++ stuff, right? Um, so what resources do we have? Um, well, the, well, the most common resource, or second most common resource, I would say, is the classroom. Be it in university, in school, or just some training site, if you get some, some external trainer. Um, so being taught by someone else up front and, and or in workshops, classroom training. Um, 
there are a lot of teachers who are really enthusiastic about teaching C++, who are really interested in the language. Um, most of them also invest the time to keep up to date with the language, and that's fine. But um, there are also professors and teachers who don't really have the interest in teaching, who have to teach. For example, one thing I really hear very often, which is in Germany, I have heard it from France and from other countries as well. If you are a professor at a university, you just want to research. You can't just research. If you want to have that research money, you have to do some teaching. And so they go ahead and um, in the early 2000s, they prepare a talk or a, 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 less, or a bunch of lessons for C++. And ever since then, they have teached the C++ from the early 90s. Um, they've come up in the 2000s. So um, I've seen in, in online communities and in forums lots of students in the 2010s so, and so on who come up with uh, basically uh, C with classes knowledge from the early 90s. Because... <coughs> Think? <coughs> My mic is breaking off. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, for example, in 2015, I've seen this blog post online. Stop using Turbo C++. For those of you who don't know Turbo C++, um, this was a compiler by Borland in the late 90s. Um, Pretty much the same compiler then later has been relabeled under a different vendor, Cold Gear, and then under yet a different vendor, Embarcadero. Um, under the hood, Embarcadero still used this thing in 2015, and it gave <coughs> lots of problems, but it's a late 90s compiler. Mm -hmm. And in 2015, we had like GCC, Clang, uh, NSVC who were C++ plus 14, who could do C++ 14, and I was wondering who would still use like Turbo C++, which can only do like maybe pre C++ 98 or rarely C++ 98. So I left a comment. Um, this blog post has to be nonsense, right? I mean, uh, the world has moved on since back then, and uh, I got a reply. Thanks for the comments. Um, I completely agree. In the most of the engineering colleges in India, students are forced to use Turbo C++ in classrooms. I don't know if this is really true, but this seems to be an experience that at least this person has has had. So, um, if you, it's it's maybe not only up to teachers, but only to, but also to 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 institutions to give out the curriculum you have to teach if uh, things like this come up. So it can be a problem if you have if you are learning in a kind of this institution then you don't have much of a chance of a chance except for looking outside the institution. So next resource books um, who has not read any C++ books in the last years. Okay. Okay. Um, there are definitely pros to books. I mean, um, usually they are <coughs> large, uh, they have the didactic context, so you have like one uh, curriculum you can go through. Um, you don't, except for classrooms, you usually doesn't, don't, don't have this. Um, Books are usually reviewed, so you can kind of trust what is in there. Um, with some of the uh, recent um, self-publishing services, I've had the experience that um, someone uh, pretends to review the book and just gives a thumbs up, and then you practically have no review at all. Um, cons of books. Um, books last much longer than the content in it is bad. I mean, um, I have a few examples later. Um, 
in <coughs> late 2016, early 2017, I have, um, well, this is not about the validity um, after, but um, it also takes a lot of time to write a book. So um, while you're writing the book, the validity of what you're writing may change. I've been uh, the technical reviewer for a book, um, C++ 17 SCL cookbook, which came out in early 2017. So it was on time when the standard was completed, so it still had some years of validity before it, but um, the problem was the standard was still changing. So basically, two weeks before the book was published, I, just to make sure that it's all okay, I rerun all the code in it, and one part of the code just wouldn't be applied in front of HCC because they just had changed the standard library. So um, either you start early and you end up with something that's not valid anymore because the standard has changed already, or you start late and then you have like one or two or years of validity, complete validity to the you because after that the standard has changed again. Um, Errors in books are hard to fix. It's a bit little easier in ebooks, but in paper books, I mean, all those books have errors of pages. But um, honestly, who has ever looked at a errors page of a book? <laughs> if you read the Okay, so the last con regarding books is um, they usually cost a significant amount of money. I mean, um, if we are professional developers we usually earn enough money to buy a book or two per year but if you are a student like 50 60 bucks is a considerable amount of money so um this one is a bit older it's from 2013 um where someone posted a question on stack overflow that um he was just starting out learning c plus plus and the very first code he had in his book he tried to compile it and it didn't compile because iostream.h this never was standard. Turns out he had um, C++ in 21 days. Um, not the latest edition, the third edition from 1999, and it still had the old stuff. But you can still buy it on Amazon, so if you want to, um, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, if you look for it, uh, they actively promote C++, 21, uh, uh, C++ in 21 days, uh, the fifth edition from 2004. I wouldn't recommend that either because, uh, well, there's quite a few standards missing, missing in there. Um, yeah, well, one of the things also is um, if you ask developers which books they would uh, recommend, then you get a completely different list of if you ask in a, in a store or on look on Amazon or something because um, they are not about content, they are about sales and um, the company who gives the most money for the for the marketing they sell the books. Uh, next resource, blocks and tutorials. Who does not know the block role of meeting C++? You should definitely check it out. He has this is basically the list of blocks he knew about from one week. And it looks similar to this every single week. So um, there's a lot of content if you want to. It's a quite long list, yes. Um, well, I have to be honest, I skipped a few weeks back to get a little longer list, to, so it looks a bit more impressive, but it still is impressive. Sorry? Uh, no, it's on meetingcpp.com. Um, I'll come to iccp.org later. Um, the pros, um, blocks and tutorials are usually free of charge. You can just go there and read them. Um, they are also, the, the authors can also always fix some errors or if something has become obsolete, they can basically remove the whole blog post. Um, to be honest, um, at least I usually don't. I don't go through all of my blog posts and see if they are all still valid because um, it's been some time. It's been quite a lot of blog posts already. Um, so um, if someone tells me there's something wrong with your blog post, I will fix it. But if not, um, Stuff that is outdated might be on there quite a few, uh, quite a time. Um, usually, also you have hardly any review before you publish it. Um, the review you get is from readers who read your blogs, and um, 
tell you there's, there's something wrong with it, you could have done something different. Um, so please, if you read any blogs and you find something that needs a comment, then comment either publicly or write the author an email. They really appreciate it. And um, the, last part, the last part is basically you don't have this curriculum like in a book where you can go from A to B because um, you get like different bits of pieces. You get um, like something about that list now, um, things was about some new standard feature now, then a blog post about CMake and the next blog post is about something completely different. So, um, but um, there's also video tutorials. Um, for example, in, uh, the, the C++ weekly from Jason is really amazing. Um, <laughs> um, but you also have to be careful which blog posts you read. I mean, if you go to like the, the, the blog post from Jens or at cpp.org, there you see um, a lot of blogs that are recommended, then that's usually okay. But if you just search for blog posts, um, there may be good ones and there may be bad ones. For, for example, um, I found a YouTube video um, teaching C++. Yes? I just wanted to comment. You mentioned C++ Weekly. Did it on the air here, on the record. Not every episode of C++ Weekly is a best practice, right? <laughs> yes, OK. The comment is um, not every episode is uh, recommendable. Um, something is just, just fun nonsense. But I think you still learn a lot of about C++ yes. with the fun nonsense. So. It's, it's, maybe it's just playing around with features, but um, you learn something from it, right? Um, this is not from playing around with features. This is playing around with something that doesn't compile at all. Um, for those who wonder, this is Turbo C++ 98. Um, the video is from somewhere 2014, 15, 16, or something like that. Um, you see iostream.h again. Um, you see beautiful formatting all in the first column. Um, best variable, variable names, right, Kate? Um, <laughs> and, um, sorry? No, because it's iostream.h. There was no namespace, SCD and iostream.h, at least on Turbo C++. So, um, similar thing, a blog post about string handling functions in C++. Iostream.h, Conyo.h, String.h, those are the C headers and the C functions for um, character array handling. And probably they wrote something in Word and then just copied it because um, some tool just capitalized all the, the Cs and Ss in the first column. So um, you really have to look out what blocks we want to read and what we don't want to read. But for something very new to C++, it is hard to decide is this a good blog post or isn't it? Um, those, are, is, well, those are the blog posts that trigger Stack Overflow questions. I have this piece of code and everyone laughs at them. Why, why are you trying to use this piece of code? Yeah, well, this blog post said it or this book said it. So it's, it's, it's a problem for, for newcomers. Um, next resource, <laughs> conference videos. Preferably with audio. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, conference videos on YouTube. Uh, a few are also on, on Channel 9. But I think most conferences have their playlist on YouTube. So meeting C++, ACCU, CPP, Gone CPP Now, you can all find it on YouTube. And um, there's some really amazing content in it. So also, if you didn't or couldn't attend all the four or three talks you wanted to attend in one time slot um, today or yesterday. Um, they will be hopefully online later and you can uh, watch them. So, um, Another resource, colleagues and um, just reading source code. I know people learn by just reading some source code. And of course, there's also some pros and some cons to this. Um, if you are learning from your or reading codes or learning from your direct colleagues who are working in your team, this can be very beneficial because they know the quirks of your little corner of the language you're working with. When you're working in some obscure embedded device, they know which functions you can use, which uh, that exceptions are turned off and all the stuff. 
things you won't find in general blog posts or in some general books. So um, this can really help. Um, but also, you only can learn from them what they know. So um, there are usually people more involved in learning current C++ and keeping up to date and learning. And uh, people who are not so invested, who just want to get their job done and do the same job they have done for 10 years. And from them, probably you can only learn what they have learned earlier than 10 years before. So, um, And reading code, yes, there's a lot. Yes. Um, yes, yeah. Oh, me too. I've done, yeah. I started the old block stuff because um, I was in a house where lots of legacy code and lots of legacy knowledge was abundant. And um, um, they asked me a few questions, and I started. Well, um, in effect, I could also just instead of writing a little wiki for them, I could just write a block. So. Um, so especially in the early years when I was in that company, I blocked way more than now. But uh, okay. Um, this is a really good question. So the question is, um, how would I recommend finding uh, good uh, good code to review for beginners or to read for beginners? Um, just say go to GitHub. It's very difficult because at GitHub you have like really broad range of, of, of code bases. Um, some code pages are way too huge to just read through. Uh, some code pages are, um, well, written by non-C++ developers or by C++ developers who don't use the newest or the, the, the current modern C++. Um, so it's, it's really difficult. Uh, yes? I will fall to them. I, I'll come to SG20 later. <laughs> um, so it's uh, we have GitHub, yes, um, but it's not uh, easy to point people to one particular code base. I mean, um, if you go to Stack Overflow, there's a list of definite of the, def the definite list of books for C++ or something. I would really like to have like a list of definite uh, C++ modern C++ repositories on GitHub where you can just go and read, and that are not too large and that are comprehensible, and where you really can read them. Um, because usually, one other thing about code bases, um, they are written to be compiled and executed and to work, and usually not written so everyone who does not know the language can immediately understand what's going on and learn from it. So. Um, Huh? Yeah. Uh, yes. You 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 shouldn't try to read libraries. You should write try to read actual projects because if you don't want to write libraries, um, reading libraries will just teach you the wrong stuff. It will teach you to care for every possibility and. Um, Convolute your code and um, not to write clear domain uh, specific code. So um, definitely don't try to read standard library code unless you want to learn how to be a library implementer. Um, another resource where I personally learned really a lot from are these uh, forums, uh, Stack Overflow, um, mailing lists, and so on. Um, you can go there um, with different approaches. You can just go there and, and continue to interact with the people over there to ask them questions and learn. Or they include chat, uh, yes, or chats. Um, I can, I'll, I'll mention the Discord later. Um, so just interact with people in communities to just ask them questions and get the answers. Um, I actually used uh, this forum. This is a German C++ community and, and Stack Overflow for some time to not ask questions, but just find interesting questions to answer. So just to get some ideas of problems that could that I could try to solve and then go online or search in books and uh, search online to, for, for solutions. And this quite of talk, uh, kind of taught me quite a lot about general C++ development. Um, 
pros is um, you have multiple re views. So um, if you have like one question, you don't get one answer. You get like five different answers, and people comment on the answers, and you have like different opinions. You could have solved that differently, and not only one opinion, which might be okay for some cases and not for other cases. So it's I mean, I think often it's good to have like these different viewpoints on on the same stuff. Um, cons is again very specific topics and single bits and pieces you have to learn from. Um, there's often very much noise. Um, there's very often basically the same question asked over and over and over again. So um, you don't learn too much from that. And um, there's, especially in the larger communities like Stack Overflow, there's a big problem of trolling and toxicity going on, especially if you go to Stack Overflow and have lots, like some beginner questions. Um, you won't get RTFM because um, they, um, they don't allow sh such uh, short answers, but basically you will get um, go and read it and uh, don't bother. So um, it really depends. Uh, Again, um, you should, if you are starting out and um, don't want to get into this kind of, of, um, of behavior, um, look for smaller communities to more supportive communities. Um, I really can recommend the include, hash include um, Discord, where you can just ask and get the answers. So. Um, well, all these resources I just mentioned have some flaws or another. So uh, what do we need to get some better resources? These are just some thoughts. Um, I don't have the definite answers. Um, we have something with authority to attract the students. Because um, if you go and you want to read blog posts and you have like uh, 50 different people who are posting blog posts about the same topic and um, 50 different opinions, it's difficult, and um, but if you have like central uh, central locations on the net where you can go to search for uh, the right blog post for your for your problems, this is uh, much better. So um, this authority is, is I think, uh, something that's needed. Um, regard uh, the flexibility or volatility to to account for the rapid changes in the language which is why I don't recommend books that go too much into detail on what is modern C++. General books are OK, but if you read what's modern C++ and have a C++ 11 book, C++ 20 may be completely different. Um, but also for those different needs, for those different niches where you, um, if you are developing for mobile or for uh, microcontrollers or whatever. so. Um, you have to need, we need this, this flexibility, I think. Um, a community to have these different points of views and to actually have people who update this stuff um, because um, like C++ in 21 days, if someone in 2004 decides to not po um, provide new editions of the book, then this is the last book that will be sold and it will be sold like 20 years in the future. Um, and so, um, what do we have in this regard? We have isocpp.org. If you don't know it, I really recommend to go there. It's not really a resource in itself to learn, but it's a good hub to find resources to learn. Um, you have a forum where questions are asked, where you can discuss. Um, you have, well, a meta blog more or less, I would say, where you have like little snippets where they post about other blog posts uh, that they recommend and why they recommend them. Um, you have links to videos from all different co conferences. Um, you have like lists of events. For example, here in the lower end of the screenshot, you see upcoming events, C++ on C. Um, you have info about the standard committee, about the standardization process, if you always wanted to um, know about that or even participate. And I think they have merged like three or four different C++ FAQs in the past. So um, if you have one question, you have a feeling like this is a question that might be asked a lot. So just look in the, F in the FAQ. And um, this is a good resource to, to, to find this kind of thing. Um, regarding the authority I mentioned earlier, isocpp.org is run basically by the standard committee or by 
the organization that also is represented by the standard committee. What else do we have? Um, the CPP core guidelines, which is a really large set of guidelines of best practices, what we can do, which is basically um, this kind of stripping down the huge set of what is C++ to get down to um, a bit the good parts. So um, there are rationale, so, 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 so reasons why these are best practices, why you shouldn't use it, um, different stuff. Um, there are rules for static analyzers, um, so you can use your Clang Tidy or, or other static analyzers with these rules to check your code that you really don't violate those best, best practices. And there's also a support library to make your code more readable for you and for those static analyzers, so um, I really recommend checking that out. Next thing is uh, cppreference.com, which is um, well has become like the de facto online reference for C++. It's a wiki format, so it's community driven. Um, if you find something wrong in there, if you find something has to be added, you can just edit it and um, and fix errors that are in there. It's up to date because um, lots of people who see the new standard, upcoming standard papers, who see changes, just go there and edit them to, to up the new stuff. Um, but it's only a reference, so you don't have like this book which really teaches you. It's in parts very technical, um, so you need some knowledge, but if you want to know about, I don't know, um, upcoming features and, and what they are and how they work, um, it's really good to, to read this. So it's not only code in there, but also prosa, so you can understand what's, what's going on behind the, the uh, under the hood, sorry. Yes, um, there are examples on most pages um, that use features, <laughs> and what actually not everyone knows, those examples are executable code. They are tied to Coliru, which is an online compiler, and you can just go there and edit the code and play around with this and try it out. So this is a really nice way to play around with new features. And in the end, there's SG20. Uh, it's a new study group in the standard committee, which has been formed, I think, in the late 2018, in December some, sometime. They had the first phone call like uh, two and a half weeks ago. Um, the aim is to um, discuss teaching strategies and to provide guidelines to build curriculums for teachers, for professors, and um, but using these guidelines, I think if they are done, we could also ourselves go just ahead and go through these guidelines and build our own curriculums to learn for our own, uh, to learn on our own if you are self-taught. Um, I'd like to say that I participate or that I am up to date with these uh, with the emails, but I've been on vacations like uh, two weeks, and when I came back, I had like 400 new emails in my inbox. So um, it'll take some time. But I think this is a, a really interesting study group. Um, um, there are a few names uh, relatively often posting in it, um, like Bjarne is really involved in this. Um, I have seen emails from Herb Sutter and a few other names. So. Um, the the committee itself is really interested in bringing this thing forward because um, this all the stuff that I've I've talked about now really is a problem for many people and many people see it as a problem and um, that's why it's good why it's good that we have not only more conferences but only also this efforts to to basically streamline the learning process and and centralizing it a bit. Um, So before we come to the questions, um, the last time I gave this talk, I got one question. I got one question asked by a professor who is teaching C++. He asked, how would you go to teaching C++ to novices? I cannot answer that question. I am not a professor. I'm doing a bit of blogging. I'm doing a bit of internal training. But I don't have those overarching answers because, um, I mean, if it needs a study group in the standard, obviously nobody seems to have 
a good answer to this one. So thanks a lot. And uh, I think we have plenty of time for questions, right? Yes. Yes. Um, depends how you define embedded. I mean, embedded goes from uh, basically um, a little lower than a PC, um, where you have like all you need. Um, I mean, on a good Raspberry Pi or even something bigger, you can have memory. You can use smart pointers, shared pointers, all the way. Um, if you go down to um, smaller devices where you don't have actually have memory, um, then smart pointers for really managing memory don't make much sense. But with all the allocator work upcom upcoming, um, I think that you still can use smart pointers with different allocation strat strategies that do the freeing and, and um, allocating for you. I mean, it's it's... Yeah. We are getting there. We are not really there. I mean, there's um, we have study group 14 who is um, going for game dev and latency, but it's all also targeted at embedded who is going for kind of um, I think em embedded standard libraries and um, doing some stuff in this direction. So um, the stuff we have right now m may not be working out of the box for embedded, but you can adapt smart pointers or write your own RAI classes to do whatever is needed in embedded. <laughs>